Baby, knock knock. Who's there? Medicine. Medicine who? Buy a little medicine. <laughs> Leave me hide a second. <laughs> so we're live. We're a couple of minutes away from our virtual class. Sabi ko na sa'yo, dapat nag-makeup tayo eh. Make me sad because we're laughing too much. Ah. But seriously, this has been so fun. We haven't even started the class. <laughs> this is gonna be a fun one. This is gonna be a fun class, everybody. <laughs> yes, Come we're gonna have a quiz us. after. Yeah, send your Q&A. We have one minute left. Yeah, we'll wait a couple of minutes for people to actually sign up, um, sign in to YouTube. To live. You can see <clears throat> for a couple of minutes, Merle. <laughs> I'm on the top of the world and looking. That like a carpenter fan. We're only going to talk about financial aid. Yes. And we'll Pretty have a karaoke easy. session after. Merle. Yes. Said. <laughs> Are we gonna give up money after this, Miss Baby? Huh? Are we gonna give up money after this? Sure. Where are we gonna get them from? Oh, from the Pell Grant. <laughs> from where? The Pell financial Grant. aid. From financial aid, yes. Oh, and the promise from the grant from your school. <laughs> That's like our, our work study. They have to sing, sing for work. <laughs> okay, so we're starting. Um, yeah, so welcome everyone to our final virtual class for September. Say hi, stop share of the screen. Um, yes, so we're starting. Hello, hello, mga kasokal. It's Mick, and today is a Sunday. I hope you guys had a great weekend, and now it's time to unwind. It's 7 o'clock, and you know what time that is? It's time for SoCal Pinoy's virtual class. So our last virtual class for the month of September is with Merle Sweet and Baby Scudder, and they will be talking about how to navigate the financial aid process in colleges and universities. So let's all welcome Merle and Baby. Hi. Hello, hello, Kasoko Pinoy. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. So Mick, uh, we are going to navigate tonight this um, mystery about financial aid and how to start from A and end up in Z. Um, should I share my screen now? Or should I do a little dance? You can do a dance for us first. I'm just uh, okay. <laughs> let, let me put the spotlight on you. There you go. <laughs> I will just be an audience. <laughs> Okay, all right, guys. Um, I'm gonna be serious now. 
So I know some of you are parents here tonight. Some of you are probably students. And when you go to your financial aid offices, it feels like a forever thing where I know my kid and I can't believe this. I've worked in financial aid for like over 15 years. I never thought I'd see the day that each of my kid would be applying for financial aid. And actually I'm down to the last one right now, <laughs> applying for financial aid and I can't believe it. It's like, wait, wait a minute. I was processing this uh, when I was in the office and now you're the one actually applying for it. And I'm involved with filling out the application because my kids know nothing. And I know for you, uh, a lot of you viewers right now, you feel like, man, what is this? It's kind of like applying for citizenship. What are these questions? Uh, so we're here to sim simplify things from the financial aid standpoint. And you as an applicant, you probably have a lot of questions. So feel free to type it um, on, the, on, you know, on the chat box and Mick will be reading it later on. And so enough of me, now let's hear from Baby Scudder. Hi, I'm Baby Scudder. I work for a community college here in San Bernardino for 25 years. I retired about five years ago, but being in financial aid for 25 years, I still have it. You can still ask me questions and I can still help you fill out your FAFSA. And I can tell you a little bit of how to qualify. Okay, now back to Maryland. Okay, so just to give you a little background, uh, when I started college here, I was, you know, I'm, I'm a person that I like to work. So I was at El Camino College and I was volunteering at their vocational uh, office. It was a, like a career office. So I was there, you know, being friendly with the staff, but then, you know, I found myself helping them with office work, filing uh, those papers. And one of the staff asked me, hey, Marilyn, you're working. Why don't you, you know, get paid? I said, okay, are you gonna put me on payroll? And he said, no, 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 no. There is a federal student uh, aid and you can apply for work study and you can get paid through that. I said, huh? So they helped me, you know, fill out a FAFSA. As most of my students would call, uh, hey, I want to apply for PASFA. That's not the right word. It's FAFSA. Not, what was the other word? <laughs> not FAFSA. FAFSA, okay? <laughs> FAFSA. Filled it out, and lo and behold, I didn't realize that I qualified for, like, I think $2,000. And for someone who never worked and to be receiving, like, $500, you know, every two weeks on a payroll, like, oh, and I'm, I'm a student, I'm receiving this, and I also get financial aid, like the Pell Grants. It was a hallelujah day for me, and that's how I've been hooked up in the financial aid field until I retired from the, uh, from the office work in 2014. So I would like to share, with Mick's permission, uh, our slide tonight. So that I can see what we're talking about. Uh, and don't worry, there's so much to know about financial aid. Uh, and there's never enough time to, you know, to ask questions with your counselor. So here, here we are. We're going to navigate through this and we're going to understand this, you know. Uh, from a layman's uh, perspective. Now, what we're going to talk about tonight is not to replace the, the guidance, the advice of your own financial aid uh, personnel at your school. We're just here to guide you, to make the process easier. Uh, we want to refrain from giving you advice because it would not be fair uh, to give you an advice uh, based on this segment that we're representing when there's so many out there. Like we have the community colleges, we have the proprietary, we have the CSUs, we have the UCs, and then now we're gonna go to graduate schools. Now that's totally different animal. 
So we're just here to help you navigate, but it does not replace, you know, your financial aid professional's advice. So this is me. Uh, I started, you know, my college at El Camino, which is the Compton Center. And while I was, you know, okay, so when I graduated from my AA, my associate's degree, my boss was hired at another school. And then he dragged me with him. I uh, had no background in financial aid. And I know Baby will tell you about her story too. You know, anything, but because he knew I was a hardworking, you know, uh, employee, he recommended me right away and I got hired on the spot. And I only got uh, interviewed once and the next day I reported to work. And then while working, I also was earning my bachelor's degree. So I was working full-time, going to school full-time. And at that time I had little kids. So three full-time jobs at the same time. Enough for someone to go crazy, but I don't know how I made it by God's grace. And as I was, you know, working, then I went on with my uh, graduate program. So from 1999 to 2014, that's all I've been doing. I love the job. I just wanted something else uh, in another capacity, uh, but still be able to help the students out there. So now I'm gonna give this back to Miss uh, Baby Scudder. Hi. Again, it's me. I had my bachelor's degree from the Philippines. And in the Philippines, there is no financial aid. So when I was applying for a job here in America, the first job that I applied for was to be a secretary in financial aid at San Bernardino Valley College. And I got hired. So since there was no financial aid, I knew nothing about financial aid. And so my boss gave me six, no, three years to learn financial aid. I, and I learned it in six months. And then from being a secretary, I moved to, to be a um, financial aid specialist. And then I retired in 2015 because I wanted to do something else. But financial aid is still in my blood and I still want to advocate for students, especially those students who doesn't know anything about financial aid. And so there you go. I had 25 years in financial aid and I know that I can still help you. Back to Marilyn. All right, moving on. <clears throat> what is financial aid or as many of our students who just entered college, they call it uh, FAFSA. Okay, FAFSA is not the financial aid, it is the application. And that application is what you fill out. And that you know application is what will determine if you're eligible or not. So there's basically two different kinds of financial aid out there. Uh, one is need-based, meaning it's based on your income and household size. So that's why we call the Pell Grants, Federal Pell Grants. There used to be a grant called SEOEG. Uh, baby, is that still available? I think the federal government still have some funding, but um, the school set up a criteria for students to receive it, like uh, the they, it's based on their GPA. Mm -hmm. And so the first 250 will receive the SEOG, which is the Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant. It's not very much. I mm -hmm. think it's only like 500 for the year based on full-time enrollment. Yes. But uh, the big one is the Pell. Mm -hmm. So Pell Grant is going to be based on your estimated financial aid, uh, estimated family contribution. So if your parents did not make a whole lot of money, chances are you're going to have a, a higher need. So they're going to equate your grant based on your need. Uh, and FCOG is what they do is they award us as a school a certain budget. So when I was working as director of finance for a school, I will get this budget. 
And so I have to see, okay, how many students do I have that have zero EFC? And then I, let's say I have a hundred from my campus. So I would divide that pie, you know, to a hundred students that would receive it. That's how that other grant works. And there's also scholarships. Uh, there's other uh, aid like for community college. Uh, we have, uh, I'm gonna let Miss Baby talk about the community college uh, grants. We like have Cal Grant from, from the Chancellor's Office of California, Cal Grant and then uh, Pell Grant. And then we go to, well, during my time, we have the Board of Governors grant that pays the tuition for the students. And I believe that they change it now. And it's now uh, also based on your GPA or um, your, I think your enrollment status as well. And then, um, and then there is loans too for, uh, but we do not actually, um, we do not um, advise students from the community college to take out loans. It might be better if they will save it for until they decide to go to the university because universities are more expensive than the community colleges. So there you go. Your Pell Grant is based on your EFC, just like what Marilyn mentioned to you, uh, meaning your EFC is your expected family contribution based on your parents' income if you are dependent. And if you are independent, then it's based on your income. And um, the way the Pell Grant is distributed, it's based on if you are full-time, three-quarter time or less than half time, half time and less than half time. And uh, we have a computation on how we disperse it to students. So there you go. Back to so, Marilyn, she has a lot to say. <laughs> so for, you know, community college is a really neat thing. If you, you know, okay, think about this. You're going to college and you don't want to come out of college having a lot of student loans. So um, if you can get rid of your classes and take all of your, you know, general ed at a junior college, that would be best for you because number one, you have the um, promise grant from the state, which covers your tuition if you're a California resident. Uh, and what I mean by resident, because we're talking about federal uh, aid, you are a legal resident or a green card holder or you're a citizen, then that's when you're eligible for federal aid. Any federal aid that you're gonna apply for requires that you have to be um, permanent resident or you're a citizen. Now, there is also another financial aid from the state level, which, you know, I'm gonna throw this back to Miss Baby to cover it. Uh, it's with Cal family. Grant. It's a Cal Grant based based on, well, Cal Grant is also based on GPA. And um, I don't know how the, um, the chancellor of the California community colleges are, are um, giving it out to students. But when I was in financial aid, what we do is um, we, we um, advocate for all students to apply for Cal Grant because they were separated from, from applying for your FAFSA. But now, but now when you fill out your FAFSA, you are also applying for Cal Grant as long as you are a California resident and a US citizen or a permanent resident. Baby, what is the requirement for res residency? How many years? one year and one day wow. because if you are not a california resident then you're going to be required to pay the non-resident fee which mm -hmm. is at my time it's 1600 per unit wow that's a lot and the pell grant for the 
a private, you know, segment, uh, let's talk about schools like, uh, you know, private colleges. What they do is the Pell Grant mostly goes to your tuition, it goes to pay your tuition first. And then that's not gonna be enough because most likely the tuition is so high, then you're gonna incur student loans. That's why I was saying earlier that if you can get rid, if you want to go for a four year degree and you can get rid of a lot of your classes from a JC, do it. You'll save a whole lot of money. And the advantage is, uh, okay, take note, the advantage uh, uh, on a junior college over a private school is you actually get to receive your Pell Grant as if you're on payroll, right, Ms. Cutter? Yes. 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 That's the beauty of it. It's kind of like going to school and getting paid to go to school. So I hope you guys are, you know, uh, thinking about that, uh, parents. I mean, don't think that, oh, I'm not going to send my kid to a junior college because it's not this prestige. Like, you know what? I'm not going to even go there. It is education, our, our, our state, put it out there for us to take advantage. It's your choice, you know, to pay a whole lot of money that you didn't really have to and to, you know, put your student or your children in in that loan and you getting more loans, take it from financial aid people because we don't want to be certifying student loans really if we, you know if you don't need it. But JC is the best route. And if you don't want to go, you know, if you don't shoot for degrees, the next thing that you can do if you're in a hurry to get a job, go to vocational schools, uh, tech, you know, trade schools like we have LA Trade Tech or schools that, you know, train you to be what you're gonna be doing when you start working, like medical biller, you're gonna be a, an office assistant, a dental assistant, then I would suggest that's what you do. Uh, if you're passionate about cooking, go to culinary school. Uh, don't spend a four years, you know, of your money when all you wanna do is cook. Doesn't make sense. Am I making sense, Miss Baby? Yes, you are. <laughs> yeah. So now uh, let's move on to the next point because I know we only have like a short time, but there's so much to talk about. When you apply for aid, are you eligible for the type of aid you're applying? I think we covered that already. Whether this aid is uh, a state aid or a federal aid, your financial aid office can tell you the difference and what the amounts are. Now let's move on to completing the aid process. Guys, make sure, or parents, if you're helping your children apply for FAFSA, don't let them just do it. And they're watching TV halfway because if they make a slight mistake, um, let's say they click on, you know, on being a male instead of a female. Guess what? You, they're gonna they're gonna have a problem if the selective services cannot match them. Miss Baby, uh, tell them more a little, a little bit more about selective services. <laughs> selective service is a requirement to apply for the federal aid for male that were like eighteen to. I forgot the age, Marilyn. I think oh. From 18. 18 to age 24, they yeah. have to apply for selective service. You have to register for that. You, you, yeah, they have to register because if they don't, then there is a possibility that they might not be eligible for the federal aid. Yes. Uh, chances are that you're, not, you're gonna be declined for aid because you know you have to resolve that issue with your financial aid office. Uh, you take your student aid report, it's like, hey, how come I'm not eligible? And we're looking at you, it's like, okay, what's the problem? Uh, it's telling me selective services and I'm looking at you, you're a female. Okay, you must have answered you're a male and most likely that's the case. Uh, another you know, common mistake that applicants uh, do is uh, on, the, on the citizenship, issue. 
there's a question there if you're, uh, you know, a US citizen or not. And sometimes when you answer no, uh, it's gonna ask for more, you know, question. Or if you make a mistake and you uh, you you answer your US citizen and you have not really gotten your uh, naturalization, if that's the case, it's gonna get stuck in the social security office. So it's another issue that's gonna hold your financial aid and that needs to be resolved. So be careful on answering those questions. Uh, another mistake is when you get to the income side, you might add one more zero and that will disqualify you for financial aid. So it's so many, there's so much, you know, detail to pay attention to when it comes to filling out these forms. That's why it's best, you know, you take your time, don't be filling it out and happily watching TV or a movie, make sure you, you know, you're focused, you're just on it and that's all you're doing. And another thing, when you are filling out your FAFSA, just like what Marilyn said, you have to be very, very careful so that you will not be selected for verification. Because if you are, explain it to them, Marilyn. On the student loans? Uh, on everything. If they're selected for verification, everything will have to be uh, checked. Everything, their income oh, tax yeah. and we don't we don't accept any more paper income taxes we request the uh transcript from the irs yes there is something called data retrieval retrieval tool in there when you apply i can't believe you know i'm i'm, I'm talking like this and <laughs> i'm not getting paid <laughs> i should be in the office um, but this is how we were you know in the office uh they, there's a data retriever tool and that helps a lot for you because it minimizes uh, mistakes and it helps you know us financial aid uh processors because there's less error to you know to correct so take advantage of that uh i think there you have no other option we don't have any more paper papsa um, I think you have to request for one or you have to print out your own, but mostly we're using um, online application processes now. All right, now loans. There's two types of loans, uh, federally guaranteed and those that are not guaranteed. Now, if you're applying for a federal loan, that is a guaranteed loan. So it's not gonna be based on your credit as a student, Unless you're a parent applying for a, a parent plus loan, that is uh, credit based. So if you have uh, a ding on your credit in the last three months, you're gonna be declined. But it's not the end of the world because if you get declined, your dependent student can apply for the uh, additional loan, and they would still they should still be funded, uh, you know, in school. But again, if you're going to a junior college, you, you're not even gonna worry about a student loan. And there are, you know, not federal guaranteed loans. This is also private loans because in some cases, uh, the tuition is so high in a private college that your financial aid is not enough to pay for the tuition. So you either pay out of your own pocket or you apply for a credit-based loan. And a federal loan is gonna be due starting six months after you uh, drop out of school or graduate or fall below half time. Okay, don't worry about you know those words. You will figure that out when you do an exit counseling. So I'm not gonna dwell on that. And on the credit-based loans, I would shy away from that if I were you because the interest is so high and you're gonna get billed right away, most likely. Now, Miss Baby, do you have anything to add to that before we go to the last point? No, I think you covered everything about the loans. Okay. Income adjustments, let me just be upfront with you guys. It's time consuming job for financial aid staff. 
um, we this is gonna be needed when your income at the time you applied for financial aid was high enough to qualify. But now that you're you know going to a school, you're actually entering school. You just got laid off because of COVID or someone in the family that you know contributed to the household income has been affected. So now <laughs> you can actually ask for income adjustment and they're gonna ask you know, probably for the last pay stub, uh, income tax, copy, and you're gonna write you know, uh, a poem, no, not a poem. <laughs> you're gonna, you're gonna say, why are you applying for you know, income adjustment? And from the financial aid standpoint, I'm gonna make sure it's fully documented that, okay, before I approve this, Make sure I have all T's crossed, I's dotted. Okay, I have the documentation to support um, this judgment, and then you'll be approved. We're gonna adjust your financial aid as if you know it's based on this year where you have less or no income. Miss Baby, I know you have something to add from your segment. You're talking about the financial aid appeal. Yes, professional judgment. The professional judgment. Mm -hmm. Um, if they have a change of income, then it has to go through professional judgment. What we do is we create a panel and then your paperwork will go through that um, group of people. And then it's kind of like they will look at each and everything that you submitted. And if they say, okay, let's approve that, then you can have your financial aid based on the new uh, income that you submitted. Another sure. thing that, um, that you have, it, that's the reason why I told you earlier that when you are filling out your FAFSA, you have to be very, very careful as far as writing down your, your income. But in this case, this is an income adjustment. Sometimes there are, there are times that the, the committee will not approve this for some reason or the other. I'm not sure why, but I haven't, I haven't sat in that committee before, but um, if you cannot really prove that there was a change of income, then they're not gonna approve it. And so whatever your EFC is, your eligibility will be based on the old EFC which might be that your Pell will just be too small. At this point, the Pell has gone up to 6,345, I think. Full-time enrollment for the year. Hey, day. Yep. Yep, so there you go. Back to Marilyn. So, there's another professional judgment called dependency override and dependency overrides just, you know, goes like this. I am Jane Doe applying for financial aid and actually I'm not 24, I'm not 24 yet. And, you know, hitting the age of 24 makes you, you know, independent. So, but because I'm not 24 yet, I'm still dependent on my parents' income, but I don't have parents. They kicked me out of the house. Uh, they don't want me to come back home. Uh, they don't want to have anything to do with me. Why? You don't want to know. <laughs> okay, this is a typical story that we hear in the office. Uh, so now I'm, you know, almost homeless. Uh, and what we mean by homeless is not necessarily that you're living on the streets begging for money. Uh, it could be that, you know, you don't have a permanent address. You are, you, you know, staying on the couch of your friend, uh, but then you're only there for, you don't know how long. It could be one day, one week, one month. So you really have no permanent address. So you're like on the verge of homelessness. So that's your case, but you have to prove that. And Miss uh, Baby from her segment, they do that a lot. Uh, and what we do is once we get your full documentation, prove to us, you know, why you're this. Uh, it's basically, you know, just documentation. We don't want to be awarding federal aid without proper documentation because we get audited too from the financial aid office. 
And when we get audited, it's not gonna be nice. So we are covering our basis. So there's two types of income adjustments or professional judgment. There's dependency override and there is that income uh, adjustment. So I think- Also selective service, Marilyn. Yeah. Selective service can also be um, professional judgment, but the burden of proof is on the student. That's right. How do you get selected? Uh, how do you get flagged uh, on selective service? Uh, okay, would you like to give a scenario, Ms. Baby? Um, I, I think what the federal government is doing is they um, check it with selective service system. Mm -hmm. So if it comes back that the student between the ages of 18 to 25, it's not registered with them. Mm -hmm. So it comes back as a C code. So when it's a C code, um, mm -hmm. there is nothing that financial aid can do, but uh -huh. to clear it. And the only way to clear it, it has to go through an appeal process, mm -hmm. just like the income adjustment. Yes. And like I said, the burden of proof is on the student. Mm -hmm. It's very, very hard to change yep. this um, selective service thing. So if you're 18 years old, male, go ahead and register with Selective Service because you will need this not only for financial aid, but there's a lot of things that here in America that will require you to be registered with Selective Service. And Absolutely. I know that for a fact because of Brock, because of my son. Yeah. And from my segment, uh, which was the proprietary school, we get uh, a lot of those flags. And the reasons are, well, before they turned 25, they were not in this country. So of course, they're not gonna be registered and it's too late to register. So that's explainable. Just show me proof of, you know, your entry to the country. Um, and then, you know, we can help you uh, correct that issue. Um, Another instance is, you know, on rare occasions are students who, you know, got incarcerated. And of course their excuse like, oh, I didn't know, you know, I was supposed to register. That's not true, well, you know, because when you're there, you're not doing nothing, but you're also getting a whole lot of information on what you're supposed to do, especially if you're planning to go to college. Um, if you're 20, I think you turn 18 and you're, you know, incarcerated, I'm pretty sure the warden will tell you to register. Are they allowed to register, Miss Baby? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So there. Anything else? That was not scripted. <laughs> <laughs> Do you still have any slides? I can't see. It. Yes, I have one more. Why okay. is Uncle Sam giving us financial aid? There you go. You are America's smartest investment. How does that work? Okay. All right, you can't afford to, to go to college, but we need a whole lot of engineers and you are very smart. So in order for you to be, you know, able to contribute to the society, uh, let's say you're gonna become a nurse or a doctor one day, yeah, if Uncle Sam has invested in your education for you to become a doctor, and then you're gonna serve you know, the low-income community or you're gonna volunteer somewhere, or you're gonna become a judge, what else? You're gonna become a soldier, uh, what else? Anything you know, where you're gonna give back to your country, to your community, it's worth the investment that the government has. So the Department of Education, they have that uh, budgeted every year. That's why every year, you don't know this, but behind the scenes, um, all the financial aid professionals, we, you know, we lobby for, you know, more budget. That's why we, in California, we have uh, an association called California Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators. And we have uh, executive council and I sat in that, I was elected one, you know, one time to serve as ethnic diversity committee chair, and we went to Washington. We lobbied. 
we want more budget for our students. So that's what it is. Um, Uncle Sam wants to invest in you so that you can be a better citizen and you can give back to the community. You want to add to that, Miss Baby? No. No? You covered everything, Mary. That's a, your, your, that's your story, how you're sticking to it. Yes. Oh, um, let me just show you something. You know, like, you know what, you know, we cover. If you go, we pretty much, you know, talk more on the information that you would not encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. So we just, you know, pretty much condensed it into stuff that you're not going to read here. And if you read them here, it's probably going to be foreign to you. But all of that information, understanding aid, you can find it here, studentaid.gov. Uh, the types of financial aid are here, the eligibility, <laughs> eligibility requirements, how to apply, how to complete the process, how to manage your student loan. Don't go in default because you know what? Student loan should be the last thing that goes in default or it should never go in default because you can actually postpone your payment. If you cannot pay, you can lower it, but it can be you know, based on your income. And if your income is zero, then you're not gonna have any payment. But it does not happen automatically. You have to call you know, your servicer to let them know that, oh, it's been six months and I'm not working or my income is still low. You have to let them know. Communication is key here. Uh, there's, you know, instances where your loan can be forgiven. So read through this. We're not gonna cover that because you can read that. Uh, but if you have questions about this later on, feel free to, you know, look us up. Uh, delinquency, just remember you cannot, you know, you cannot file bankruptcy for a student loan. And if you're delinquent or no, if you, if you're in default and it's income tax filing and then you're expecting a big refund, guess what, girlfriend? You're not gonna get a refund because it went to pay for your student loan. And don't be going to the financial aid office crying. Okay, um, that's all I'm gonna have to say. Miss Baby, do you have anything to add to the student loan part? No? Okay. The, now, on, the only way the only way that your student loan can be discharged is death, <laughs> right? Yes, or it was a false certification. Yeah. <laughs> or the school went out of business uh, while you're going to school. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we're going to go back to the last part of our slide. And that is, we're almost done. <laughs> Start clapping already. Oh, not <laughs> no, we're not going back to square one. Did somebody try to badmouth me? Okay, now we're going to go to the best part. This part. <sighs> All right, I can finally sit down and relax and make. What? Yes. <laughs> I'm going to give it back to you. I'm just going to skip through. Okay. Oh, here. So I went through our YouTube live chat and we do have some questions. So thank you to those people who sent over questions. Um, so the first question is, um, who is eligible for financial aid? You want to answer? <laughs> Marilyn? I can answer it. it. You can go ahead. <laughs> As like long as you have a high school diploma, you're a California, no, a high school diploma and um, you're a U.S. citizen or a resident of, uh, what is it, uh, PR? Okay, we'll just call it green card holder. Green card holder, yes. Then you can be eligible for financial aid. And we encourage everybody to apply because nobody knows whether you would be eligible or not. Or there's one more if you're like a refugee. A refugee, oh, yes. Yes. 
Yes, you can be eligible even if you are not um, a resident or a U.S. citizen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did that satisfy the question? Yes. Uh, and um, there's another question from, from the same person. Her name is Joy. Does financial aid change every year? Yes. Yes. And it can change um, on the amount on the grant. It goes up every year, or it can also change because of your income. So let's say you have more income this year, then your financial aid is going to go down. And I'm talking about Pell Grant mainly, or those need-based uh, financial aid. So okay, it can either be the amount go up or your income change. <coughs> do you do you consider scholarships part of financial the finance financial aid package? Yes, yes, and yes. Yes. Uh, okay. And I do have, um, I myself have questions. What is the timeline for uh, applying for financially, for, for filling out the FAFSA? And for a lot of our parents in our SoCal Pinoy's group, a lot of them have juniors and seniors in high school. So when is the time that they should apply for FAFSA? Okay. Can I answer? Okay, um, if the student is graduating from high school um, this year, no, say for example, 2021, if the student is graduating from high school um, June, then they have to start filling out the FAFSA January 2nd of the same year. Correct. And that's also contingent to the school uh, because different schools have different deadlines. So like if you go to a vocational school or private school, the financial aid is year round. Um, the last day you know, to fund that aid is the end of um, last day of June of the year. Um, there are federal deadlines like academic year. Uh, for 21, 22, you know, if you go to studentaid.gov, it's all there under federal deadlines, FAFSA deadlines. Uh, colleges have their own deadlines, so check with their financial aid office, and the state also have their own deadlines. So we're like deadline after deadline. And I do have one last question. This is regarding student loan forgiveness. So in the last two years, I've seen so many programs pop up about student loan forgiveness. Can you give us a little bit of information about that? We'll start with baby. <laughs> hey, I'm equal opportunity. Been, <clears throat> you know, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, people are calling me and um, offering me loan forgiveness because of the COVID. So I think it's related to that, but I have not, I have not really uh, read anything about it lately, except for those that were set by the federal government long time ago, like uh, forbearance. It's not a forgiveness, it's just forbearance. And then there is this, um, after six months, it's deferment, you can apply for the deferment and then forbearance and um, what's the other, oh, consolidation of the loans. Those are the only three things that I know. Okay. Um, to piggyback on what Ms. Scudder is talking about uh, or, you know, uh, to answer Mick's question about loan forgiveness, if you do a public service, uh, so you work on a low income, Oh, public service, no, public service. If you go to federal student aid, managed loans, it's in there. Public service loan forgiveness, they have that. We have teacher loan forgiveness. We have school closed, closed school discharge. So if your school closed, went out of business, like a whole lot of Corinthian schools nah, that closed back then, then you know your loan can be discharged. Uh, we have breaking loans cancellation discharge. Uh, we okay if you become permanently that uh, if you become permanently disabled, disabled, yeah, 
Uh, and if you die, you can be forgiven, of course. Uh, it cannot be this in certain occasions, okay? Very rare occasions, it can be discharged in bankruptcy uh, and the judge will determine that, that this is very rare, okay? And, and the reason why it will be discharged is because there's no way, you know, the borrower can repay and there's no means, you know, to pay it. Uh, and you can read through that. There's so many information there. Um, so Mick, back to you. Okay. And um, so I think that's all about the time that we have for our Q&A. And I just wanted to thank Miss Merle Sweet and Miss Baby Scudder for sharing us with um, sharing with us their expertise and their time for our SoCal Pinoy's group. I know a lot of parents were asking about this particular topic, and it's really timely because you know there are all these changes happening um, around us. You know whether it's in financial aid, whether it's through admissions process, and so yes. this is something that you know all of us can ben benefit from. I went to UCLA, and I'm a financial aid recipient myself. I went through the entire process, but at that time, I didn't have any of this. I didn't have a virtual class to watch and understand the ins and outs of financial aid from actual financial aid employees. Um, so this is awesome. And Merle and Baby, do you have anything else to say? Um, if they want to ask me more questions, if they, especially if they're going to um, community college, because I can still ask my colleagues, you know, they can just message me. They can either send me a message in the messenger or Facebook, or they can follow me on Instagram. Merle? For me, it's simple. Uh, my goodness, we're, there's not enough time day you know to talk everything about financial aid so if you feel like you got value from this <coughs> workshop i strongly strongly uh advise you to make sure you let Mick know tell her how awesome she is we're putting these workshops together maybe she will schedule another session for you um and for miss baby uh for graciously you know joining me make sure you thank her because she volunteered her time. So that's pretty much I can say, oh, we have a, an advocacy. We have a website, well, a Facebook page that we're going to be putting updates. But your best place to go to is studentaid.gov. Unless there's like, you know, technical questions that you, you want clarification, feel free to hit me up. Awesome. Thank you so much, Merle and Baby. And before we all go, so stick to me. We, I just have some reminders. So next week, our very first class in October, it's called Cocktails of Sugarlandia. That's with Tomas de los Reyes. He's the brand ambassador of Don Papa Rum. So he'll be doing a demo of how to mix cocktail drinks using Don Papa Rum. So that's going to be a lot of fun. And then the week after that, we have something different. We have Rose Castrillo with quick tips on how to put on your makeup for those moms who have little tots. And also after that, something very different that we've never had um, in our virtual class sessions. It's youth basketball classes for your kids. So Mary Fascio, he's, she's a coach and she will be going over dribbling exercises and a lot of other techniques for basketball. And you don't need a hoop for this one. And before we all go, I just wanted to say thank you for those people who watched and stay with us throughout this entire month for our SoCal Pinoy's virtual classes. And I do have an announcement. 
I was just told while we were having this class that we finally reached 200 subscribers. Yay! Yay! <laughs> I'll be announcing the winner of our raffle for this time. So we ha now have 200 subscribers. So this is going to be our second raffle prize. That's going to be one Ube Santribal selfie from Arnold of Senor Luis de Malabon. Yeah, so I'm going to be announcing that really soon. And also, we're going to have a songwriting contest. So get your creative juices flowing and write a song about our group, So Calpi Noise. And that's going to happen in October. So we'll be announcing the winner of that contest at the end of October. And that contest is for celebrating Filipino American History Month. And so that's all I have for today. And thank you again, Merle and Baby, for sharing your invaluable time and information with us about financial aid. And for those people who have questions, you can message them directly or message me as well, and I'll get in touch with them. And let us know if you have any other suggestions or tips for us and what classes you want more of. So I'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Nick.